going to happen a lot quicker than we think because I think a lot of countries are starting to pay attention but I think they're keeping it quiet. If people aren't correctly informed how are they going to make the right decisions? Bitcoin shines a light on everything that's broken. It's a global decentralized neutral peer-to-peer -peer cash. How can that not change the world? We're being controlled by algorithms and we don't even know if what we're thinking is real or what we believe is true. We're getting to this point where governments are able to censor more and more under the guise of protecting children. So they're saying that children are being harmed because of the content that they're seeing, yet we're normalising giving iPads to two-year-olds. I had my old boss was from Jamaica and when I was speaking to her about it, I was like, oh my goodness, gosh, you guys are really far ahead when it comes to CBDCs. And she just went, oh, what, the Jamaican Bitcoin? And I'm like, don't you call it that. Mm -mm. It is not the Jamaican Bitcoin. It's completely different. And once I explained it to her, she was horrified. Just go with Bitcoin. Look at Bitcoin because it, like, you can't understand what a good CBDC is going to look like until you understand Bitcoin. And if you understand Bitcoin, you wouldn't be working on the project. Once the price pumps to a level that they can't ignore it, global adoption is ramping up. It's, it, it's quicker than the internet adoption. Mille just wants the freedom to transact, which seems like the most sensible way to go. Every Bitcoin transaction uses a swimming pool's worth of water. Oh man, that that was that that was that was uh, something. And you're fighting against that uh, article basically to be retracted because it's just completely false and completely wrong. Uh, can you take off like first of like what what the article said and what's wrong about it, and then we can get into a bit a little bit of how we can fight Bitcoin narratives and all that uh, interesting stuff. Yeah, so this is this is my favorite subject at the moment. So thank you very much for allowing me to talk about it. Um, the the article said and used the word payment and transaction interchangeably, and that actually changes the outcome of how much water, if any, uh, Bitcoin mining would use by a factor of a thousand X. So a lot of Bitcoin mining doesn't even use water. They can use closed loop systems or if they're in immersion, you know, they, they, there's not a lot of loss and there's so much nuance involved in, in, a, in a sentence like that, that you can't just write it in a in a brief article where you use these words interchangeably because the outcome is completely different. So when when I read this article, I saw that the source was a Dutch central banker called Alex de Vries and the conflict of interest between him being the source and a Dutch central banker banker hadn't been disclosed either. Well, considering Bitcoin can completely disseminate central banks, I think that that's noteworthy. So I approached the BBC, asked for a, um, put in a freedom of information request to ask how they had fact-checked the document, because I knew that Debris had been debunked in 2018, yet somehow he still is being treated as a credible source, which is why I think that they didn't fact check it. So I went back and I asked them how they fact checked and they denied my freedom of information request saying that it was protected under journalism and art. I thought that was really shocking because that means that you're never able to go to the BBC and quiz them or ask them for any information on journalism, which is crazy considering they're a news organisation. If that was Sky News, it wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had the same response. And I've found out since that it's because of the way that it's funded that they're allowed to have that clause. So the, they can just deny um, what, how they came to a story um, because uh, BBC is a government funded, I guess. Well, it's funded by license fee payers. So me. I pay £15 a month and I have no choice but to pay it. If you want to cancel your TV license you have to make a declaration to say that you don't watch any TV at all. Even if you don't watch the BBC, even if you don't listen to the radio, radio you use none of their services, you're still obliged to pay for it. Isn't it? So, but you have the choice to completely, op because I'm asking in Austria, uh, this choice was taken away uh, this year, actually, or was it last year? Like this year or last year was the choice taken away that you cannot even opt out of the television mm. license that you pay uh, each month. Like a year ago, it was still available that you just like, oh, 
I don't watch any TV. I don't even have a television in my house that is capable of watching TV. That was enough. Uh, if, if there's no television uh, in your TV, uh, in your room, then it's okay. You don't have to pay it. But now every house has to pay, no matter if they watch it or not, or are even able to watch it. So in the UK, you're still able to technically opt out of that system. Oh, so it's, yeah, so it's not as bad as Austria. <laughs> I thought it, I, I thought it was terrible that that you couldn't opt out of something that you didn't use, especially when you think it's fifteen pounds a month and you think Netflix is about eight. Now TV is in, you know, it's just not value for money, and there's no accountability because I've been trying to get a retraction on that article for ten months, and I've been sent around in bureaucratic, bureaucratic circles. So that they're not even being held accountable, or you can't hold them accountable. Okay, so uh, that that that's that's fascinating that they can just like say, especially if it's uh, from taxpayers' money. Like if it's a private institution, I'm like, okay, maybe it's 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 okay because uh, they they can say we we have those sources, or it, it's like it's a, maybe even even freedom of speech. Like is is there something? That's an interesting. Um, uh, can can you just say anything? Would you say that uh, if you are a news that is completely privately sourced, it's like maybe even like my podcast, um, is, th is there something like that? Well, when I write for Forbes, I have to back up everything that I say. Everything that I write has to be provable. And if I make a mistake or even say something where it needs to be made clearer, even if it's just fine detail, I make a correction or I make sure that it is corrected in some way. So it's 100% factually accurate. And my editor will make sure that I do that. And this can be something for just very, very minor. So the BBC have been writing Bitcoin articles since 2013, and most of them have been negative. They haven't been factually accurate, and nobody's been able to hold them accountable on that at all. I don't understand how they're, I just don't know how they're getting away with it. And when you look into the journalists that are writing these articles, they have absolutely zero background on finance or tech or anything relevant to Bitcoin at all, yet they're given these assignments. I don't understand. I think the first time I saw you was actually on a television interview about CBDCs. Is, is that right? Oh, uh, yeah, you uh, saw that. Yeah, that was a little while ago. Yes, yes. I think that went really viral well on on X. Maybe I even reposted it because that was like, oh, it's on 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 a normal TV. They they're talking about CBDCs and it's not positive. Uh, it's like against CBDCs. That was uh, something that shine out for me. That is really so. You're fighting really the the Bitcoin narrative uh, on the mainstream media side. I'm trying to because I can see that a lot if not all of the information that they're putting out there is wrong and it's harmful to people. If people aren't correctly informed, how are they going to make the right decisions? And, and we, I think we underestimate how many people actually just rely on, on those news sources. They, mm -hmm. they only have, the, the BBC only have mainstream media and articles around that. Uh, they don't go ahead and, and make the research themselves and, and dig deep in like 20 different podcasts that have uh, 500 different experts on them. Uh, th th that's like the exception. That's like the, the, a small group of people that actually do that. Uh, and most people are just like reading one article and then there's like this one or two negative things about Bitcoin. It's boiling the ocean and it uses <laughs> one transaction uses as much as much energy as a swimming pool or something like that. So and and this stuck in the head. And I think that's really important that we fight on a on every level uh on social media, but also on mainstream media on on this traditional news sources, uh those narratives. And I think it's <laughs> it's uh it's it's great that you you're doing that. Um what what why did it come to that? Like how how did you come to that fighting those Bitcoin narratives? I think it started off just by taking an interest in Bitcoin. And once it grabs you, you probably know this, you just become completely obsessed and you can't read, nothing else is interesting anymore. It's only about that. And when you understand that there are so many different angles to it, so there's a business angle, the human rights angle, the technology angle, there's um, the environmental angle, the Bitcoin mining angle. There's it, it, the one subject is huge, 
and you can go off and look into the the subject that that appeals to you the most and once you start unlearning all the things that you thought to be true bitcoin shines a light on everything that's broken and so once you see it you can't unsee it and it just becomes an obsession because all of a sudden you see that there are things we we do have an option we do have a life raft we can fix this if mm. more people understood it correctly and so once i knew that people were being misinformed and misled and i started reading all the bad bitcoin articles it just became the only important thing that i could possibly do because i've got two children and i feel incredibly guilty when i look at them because of the world that they're going to inherit so i think that if i can just focus my time on making the world a little less shit i think that's all that, that's all i can really hope for i don't i don't i don't expect the moon on a stick i don't i don't think it's going to be brilliant i just think that maybe if i can just help a few people to understand its potential and then they can go off and help other people to understand its potential then that will be a good narrative that spreads rather than a bad one do you think that right now it's uh it's it's better or worse uh, when we talk about narratives and 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 uh people are try believing what what the media is writing or is it because of social media and decentralized media a little bit better than like five ten or fifteen years ago it's it's difficult to answer that question because I think when the BBC maybe could have been trustworthy, maybe about 40 years ago, possibly, most people just went to a newspaper or one news source and that was the only news source. So they didn't have the same options. But at the same time, I think journalism was real journalism there. People would actually go and find the story. So it was actually more trustworthy. Now, we're being controlled by algorithms and we don't even know if what we're thinking is real or what we believe is true. And people are time poor. So they don't have the time, like you said, to go off and do the research, read three or four different things. But even when you're being targeted by an algorithm, how do you know that you're just not being targeted by the same wrong information? It's really difficult to know. Yeah, and no, this the, this uh, algorithm thing is a, is a real beast because <laughs> you just have to o open a feed on, um, like I sometimes do that. I, I go on my girlfriend's phone and just open the, the, her feed. And it's a completely different experience. <laughs> like there's, there's not one thing that is on my her side and on her side, it's like a, two different worlds. And I think that's, that's, um, something to, to at least worry a little bit about. I mean, we know why the algorithms work like that. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, I think it's okay. Uh, but we have to be aware of that. And we have to really like uh, figure out like, okay, what, what do I want to consume? You cannot consume everything anyways. Uh, but just relying on an algorithm might be a bad, bad idea, especially how, how personalized they are and how you basically just look at what are you engaging with uh and then that you that that will you get like that's why i'm always laughing when someone is like enraged in the comments and it's like oh that's such a video i don't like those on my feed and i'm like yeah you, you just clicked on the video and you left the comment so you gave the algorithm every everything to believe then you will get more of those videos um i, th I think that the awareness of how those algorithms work, that alone helps a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's a real thing. They, they, they give you your own world uh, and they, they make the bias and the echo chamber a real thing. I think Jack Dorsey's trying to address that. When I saw him, I went to Nostriga, which was an absolutely brilliant conference, and then Baltic Honey Badger was uh, thereafter. But he said he loved building Twitter, but he said that the algorithm has taken too much. And that's why he's starting to build Nostra with relays and a completely different decentralized model of information. Now, I, I have my concerns about that as well. But at the same time, I don't want information to be censored. I, we saw what happened during the pandemic. Even Mark Zuckerberg's coming out and saying, I'm not doing it anymore. And, and the Twitter files with Matt Taibbi proved that the CIA and, and the US government were actually going in and asking them to remove posts. The misinformation is an, uh, a tricky thing for me because uh, we don't want 
misinformation. But at the same time, if we have some authority on misinformation, that what's the difference to censorship then? <laughs> like that's really, really hard. And also, facts can actually uh, change over time. So that, like that's that's it's really hard to 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 figure it out. What, what's your stance on like? <laughs> Should we have some some misinformation or guiding? It's a it goes a little bit also with with the with the article of 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 BBC because that's clearly misinformation. That's probably that's provable. Um, but but who's the the one that says like oh this this should be deleted? The, the BBC say they are unbiased and that they are the arbiter of truth. So when it gets pointed out to them that something that they've written isn't true, it shouldn't take 10 plus months to try and get it retracted. They set themselves up as that, as that central focal point. So they've got no excuse. It's not, they're not writing opinion pieces. And then if they are, then they should make it clear that they're writing opinion pieces. And, and that's fine too. But when it comes to censoring information, I'd, I'm not comfortable with having a central authority deciding what's right and what's wrong. I don't have an answer for it, but one thing that I do feel quite strongly about is I, I think that we're getting to this point where governments are able to censor more and more under the guise of protecting children. So they're saying that children are being harmed because of the content that they're seeing, yet we're normalising giving iPads to two-year-olds. And I think that maybe there's some level of societal, a, a discourse that needs to happen where we say, hang on a sec, their brains are forming, we can't control the information that they're seeing. Adults can see what they like, they can make their own choices, but really, should we be giving phones to under 18 year olds? Like, why has that become normal? I think that that's really the problem that I have. Yeah, especially with the very young child, like under 12, that's like, I, I, I mean, I think got my first phone like 16, 17, 18, uh, so, somewhere around those lines. Uh, I think under 18, uh, it's it's still bad, but especially under 15, that's uh, <laughs> that's like really problematic. Uh, and everything under 10 is just like, <laughs> uh, get, get, get your kid outside and let, let it play with real things. Uh, and uh, maybe even like uh, there was a lot of articles like actually writing, not just on, on, on the phone and r like writing with your hand and stuff like that. I am almost not able to do that <laughs> like, uh, because you can get achy. You're like, oh, yeah. it, it's it's so hard. I, I think once a month or something like that, there's something coming along that where I have to do it. You're not uh, but, down. Uh, I've, I've, I've got like endless notes on my desk of just stuff that I just write all day long. Like, do you not write anymore? No, no I write almost never like uh sometimes i have to fill something out when i'm somewhere with the government <laughs> um uh um yeah almost right now like some maybe a note or something like that quickly leaving something i have a, um, um, a shopping list we have in the fridge where i sometimes write something but that's very rarely like and that's just a few words like 99.9999% of my writing is done by, by, by a computer. Like uh, it, it has ended uh, since I left school. In school, I was forced to. Uh, Austria school, uh, they are forcing you to write with the hands. There's uh, not a lot of it written with, with the computer. Some things are computer, uh, computer written, but most of the things are just uh, with the handwritten. And since then, um, I don't know, no. I have, I have no physical notebook. My girlfriend has a physical notebook. She writes two oh, times, three times per day, but uh, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> the, I, I take this everywhere with me. And every conference I go to, I literally write absolutely everything down. So that I'm surprised you don't write. I write all the time, but my hand does get achy. I know I don't I don't do that it's uh but I think there are uh, actually advantages to doing that like there's advantages to writing per hand. I heard that a lot. Yeah. I, I like it. I actually like the feeling of writing. But what, going back to the iPad thing is now I see kids and they have iPads with these special casings around them to protect them and handles. And I even saw this um, this little lad that had like a strap around his neck with the iPad attached to the bottom so that it was constantly there. 
and and where these are like two three year olds and it's just and then you see kids walk like in in push chairs and they're not looking around them they're not taking in the world we are heading for one hell of a crisis when it comes to this so when my biggest concern when it comes to what children see online i think it just comes down to don't give them access to the online world as young as they've got it because people say that you can lock it down but they'll find workarounds and most parents don't have a clue so you know i just honestly just let's stop normalizing this dangerous harmful tech for children maybe that's the answer and you also said uh they use that as an excuse for then censoring information because they have it so that's like the, the second fact to do that yeah Do you want to harm children? Do you want to protect children? Well, of course I want to protect children. Well, then we need access to this, 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 and this. We need to be able to have back doors that, are in, that were once encrypted. We need the online safety bill where we can get access to what, you know, and they start to build these awful Orwellian solutions that they sell to people as protection. Yeah, that makes uh, total sense. Um, one one thing I was also wondering um, with with Bitcoin right now uh, and mainstream media and politics, it it seems like Bitcoin get really gets sucked into the whole political scene, especially now with the U.S. election. That was completely unforeseen for me. I was not expecting it to be such a big topic. On the other hand, in Europe, it's not that big of a topic. We are more talking about CBDCs. We we want to obviously <laughs> want to have the CBDC and the digital euro and we really have to get this. Uh, I like, I'm a little envy of the US because they really take a big stance against CBDCs. I'm, I'm, I'm a little envy uh, of, of their stance of the CBDCs. H how political do you see uh, Bitcoin and then maybe also a little bit uh, into CBDCs as it was also my, my first uh, <laughs> touch point with you? Well, I watched Trump's speech in Nashville um, it was just an extension of the campaign trail. I mean, like three quarters of it was just fluff and nonsense. Um, he used Bitcoin and crypto interchangeably. I don't know if that was because he hadn't been briefed properly or if it was on purpose because he just wants to please everybody. Um, but the fact that he was there is a, is a big deal. The fact that RFK was there. Um, I think uh, Kamala Harris missed a trick by not getting involved um but what when the us does something the rest of the world follows so i think it will trickle down eventually if the right people are banging the drum so we have a chance in the europe uh, zone and uh, uk also that we might be able to not have cbdc's not have how's the cbdc is the, is the cbdc even called britcoin or something like that i, I heard something in the uk <laughs> Yeah, they did. They called it, it, it. I knew it was coming, but it's like, oh, Bitcoin, really? Like, so in Jamaica, there's. Have you seen? There's a thing called the CBDC tracker that was developed by the Human Rights Foundation. So you can see on there where um, the the different stages that countries are at. So if they're in the research phase, pilot mode, or if they've launched. And so Jamaica is one of the countries that's launched, but has no on off ramps for Bitcoin at all. And I had my old boss was from Jamaica. And when I was speaking to her about it, I was like, oh, my goodness, gosh, you guys are really far ahead when it comes to CBDCs. And she just went, oh, what, the Jamaican Bitcoin? And I'm like, don't you call it that? Mm -mm. It is not the Jamaican Bitcoin. It's completely different. And once I explained it to her, she was horrified because that is not how it's being sold over there. Yes, exactly. That looks really cool. Mm. So, so like the green ones that have it or are, are research, or the red ones are already launched. Wow! Yeah, yeah. China. That's a lot of red. Mm -hmm. China, yeah, Kazakhstan, Russia. Well, India also has one already. Country, and it actually gives you the stats on it. Click on that one and see. Uh, so, so Nigeria has been a bit of a failure, um, but you can see the stats. And oh man, yeah, that's really. really it's a cool website. I mm. love it. I didn't knew about it. Wait, how can I? And so you. Yeah, so, so we are still in the research phase, and we had the because I'm also a director and co-founder of Bitcoin Policy UK and the head of mining and energy. And a few weeks ago, we had CBDCs, a silent attack on democracy? Question mark. And we invited the Bank of England to come along, and they actually refused. 
You don't want to talk to us about it. Not that they weren't available, they actually refused. But when you look at the form that you had to fill in to request a speaker, it was on this utterly shit like document word document i thought my god if you can't in this day and age if you can't even make a form look good how on earth are you going to rewrite finance like there's no way that they don't stand a chance but there was this really lovely chap who was actually um working at the digital pound foundation who really bravely came along to speak at our event the only person in the room that was pro CBDCs. He sees the system exactly like we do. He sees us being manipulated. He sees the problems with money. He sees it all. And I realized that we agreed on about 80%. And it's really good when you can speak to people who are opposed to things that, you know, they, they're for things that you're opposed to. Because if you can find the common ground, it's a lot more helpful. What I realized is, he actually believes that the UK can design a good CBDC. So in his head, he doesn't see them as evil because they haven't even been designed yet. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, but I do think that it's really naive as well, considering it seems to be a global push across the world and nobody else has designed a good one. And where they have launched, they've failed. The, the question is like, how would you design a good one? Because it's all centrally controlled. Like how, how, how would a good CBDC look like? Well, um, eCash is a is is a good example of of something that because because we're using eCash with Bitcoin, so you know there are there are solutions, but the the technical abilities that these guys have, they they no one who's going to design a good CBDC is going to go near a project like that. For me, the, the 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 biggest problem is there when we establish completely digital money that is not decentralized like Bitcoin but it's centrally uh, controlled, no matter how it's designed and how it's technically designed, yeah. that opens the door, even if it's not the intention of someone that does it right now, that opens the door that someone comes along at some point and misuses that technology to control and abuse people. Yeah. That, that, that's for me the biggest thing, like no matter how it's designed, as long as it's centrally controlled by, by like a few people or maybe even just one person, uh, that, that's a huge problem for me in itself. And it's a honeypot for hackers. A major honeypot, yeah. It's the same thing with the Coinbase honeypot with all the ETFs there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, it's madness. Yeah, but but the, the, the chap um, at the Digital Pound Foundation was listening to us and he wants to have a meeting about how we would design a good CBDC. I, I do want to talk to him, but at the same time I'm thinking... This is a complete waste of time. It's going to fail. Like you're not going to do it. I could, I could, I could give you some suggestions, but just, just, just go with Bitcoin. Look, look at Bitcoin because, it, like, you can't understand what a good CBDC is going to look like until you understand Bitcoin. And if you understand Bitcoin, you wouldn't be working on the project. So just, just look at Bitcoin. But yeah. it's a journey, isn't it? Everyone's at a different stage. <laughs> Is, is there a chance that that you see that UK and the Eurozone is actually adopting Bitcoin within the next like 20, 30 years? I think it's game theory. I think once the US gets on board, you've got, you know, once the price pumps to a level that they can't ignore it, global adoption is ramping up. It, it, it's quicker than the internet adoption. Um, it's a global, decentralized, neutral peer-to-peer -peer cash how can that not change the world i think that once game theory kicks in they're all gonna have to do it and i, I even wrote an article over a year ago about how because the BRICS currencies are talking about how they want to have their own almost like an alternative to the petrodollar but they want it to be backed by commodities so china will back their part by gold and Russia will back it partly in oil, but that requires trust and verification and effort. You know, if it could be backed by a commodity that's really easy to verify and open source, it just makes way more sense. So they're not quite there yet, but I think once they get there, they're going to realize that it's a no brainer. Is, is Bitcoin maybe just, and, and it's, it's, it's weird to say that because it's already like 15 years old, it is already uh, quite large, but is it might might be just too small at that point uh, that uh, nations are really saying like, oh, we, we would like to have it as a, as a backing. I, look, it's not 
small as in how you mean how much bitcoin is available because it, it's divisible yeah no 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 uh as, as a as a market cap i think uh, a lot of those uh oh, people okay. might yeah. i mean might... the United States 15 years old and it can't grow that quickly we can't i mean if it grew that quickly it just wouldn't work it has to be slow and methodical and and, and the pace that it's growing at the moment for me is even too quick yeah, I, I worry about that because we don't have the layer twos that we need. Lightning, I'm not sure if that's ready yet. Um, there's a lot more work to do to make it a viable global system. The fear of Bitcoin growing too fast, I think that we already covered that once, but it, it's a real thing. Like if, if Bitcoin extremely fast gets adopted and all the fiat currencies uh, crashing too fast. Mm. Uh, we we might not be there with all the technology that we actually need for Bitcoin to be successful as a payment system. Mm. That that's yeah. a real thing. Is, is, that, is that actually a fear of, of yours? It's it's a concern that I have. I mean, among many, um, <laughs> one of one of many concerns. But yes, it is one. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have more concerns about, about Bitcoin or like the, the financial world? What, what do you mean with more concerns? So I think I think that there are two. You, you've got the typical maxi who just believes in Bitcoin. And then you've got kind of purists who just take it too far. Like I would say that I'm a pragmatic maxi. So I, I'm open minded to other solutions and I don't know what's going to work and what's going to fail. Um, but I do think that we need to experiment more and welcome the experimentation so that we can eventually find these solutions rather than having all these rules in place that, oh, you could be a Bitcoin if you think like me and this, this, this and this. You know, I think I think we're yeah, we, we're just too um, we need to be more open minded. And I think that providing the base layer stays completely decentralized, we will have to build centralized solutions on top but i think that the solutions will range from centralized to decentralized and, um, in, and everything in between and people will have to make choices on the trade-offs that they want to make based on what they need it for so um so i'm comfortable with a little bit of centralization when it, if it's sitting on top of the base light layer providing the base layer is completely decentralized i just think we have to be uh, more open-minded to find these solutions. It seems like uh, sometimes the Bitcoin community might be too missionary, even outside of Bitcoin. It's, there's this idea like you have to eat meat, you have to own guns, you have to do this. Yeah. Like It's like the, this this idea of like a full Bitcoiner. That, that goes too far sometimes for, for, for me. Yeah. I'm like, hey, Bitcoin is for everyone. If, if you don't want to, if, if you're weak, like I know lo a lot of weakens uh, that are popular even in the Bitcoin scene there. Uh, the, that are really big and, and uh, that are also as much Bitcoin as, as someone that is only carnivore. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating for me how people give their values onto Bitcoin and think everyone else also has to, has to think like that. Exactly that. And it's very destructive, very destructive, especially because, and going back to what you said earlier about it becoming political. I'm not entirely comfortable with the fact that Bitcoin seems to have this right wing narrative. So I, I, and I also don't like the terms left and right. I think they're super lazy. And it's just like, once again, it's a spectrum. How can you be on one side or the other? Why are you not deciding individually on each case, how you feel about something rather than going into a bucket of lefty ideas or a bucket of right wing ideas? It's a little bit like in America, where if you were a Democrat, you wore a mask. And if you're a Republican, you rejected it. I just don't see how these things work. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code ROBIN at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to 
have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. Limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. That seems, I mean, America is more extreme because like there's just two parties. Uh, that's like... <laughs> <laughs> that 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 seems to be uh I, i've in austria we have five parties and i cannot decide for one <laughs> yeah. but but it's uh but it's it's a real thing like, i think i think it's a fact that like from political scale probably more on the right side have more bitcoin than they, those on the left side it, it it seems like it seems like that but it's not like that uh Bitcoin is right or left. It's apolitical. It's 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 a money, and it's maybe right. adopted at a different uh, speed, a different demographics. I think that's all. Like, I think I hope those narratives around what a Bitcoiner looks like goes away because Bitcoin hopefully will be something like water or air, mm. where it's so normal. And you you don't say like, oh, you breathe air, then you have to be a right wing <laughs> gun owner. Like, right. no, you don't have to. Yeah. No. Abs absolutely. But you know. Like you said, it's a 15 year old asset. It's still in its infancy and, you know, it will, it will grow out of these, these things, I think. Another thing that is in the Bitcoin community, um, is there are not as many, um, women as there, there should be. I feel like the, it's like, uh, mostly male dominated. I see it at least in all my statistics that I have available to me. Uh, most of my audience is male. And then people say like, oh, be because you're male. No, uh, the most popular, uh, female podcast uh, is Natalie Brunel and she posted the statistics where she only has 20% uh, female audience. So it's definitely not because I'm a male uh, host. It's just also on, on female host side. Uh, so th that's, that, that's this uh, interesting argument. Like, why is that like that? Uh, I think most people tell me like, oh yeah, uh, women are more interested in people and, and men are more interested in, in, in things. But I feel like you, you can be interested in people and interested in, in Bitcoin. Do, do, do you as, as a woman, <laughs> um, why do you think there are not more of them? Is, is the Bitcoin community, um, is, is that right wing male focused? Maybe that's the destructive thing that we are not uh, welcoming enough for, for new people? I think there's a few things that I've noticed. Um, first of all, I do think that men are generally the early adopters, maybe because they've got more time to look into things that interest them. So just before I came on this podcast, I was like getting the washing done. I was trying to prep for dinner. I had to finish a research report that I was doing. I'm constantly all over the place trying to get everything done. My husband is brilliant, but he leaves, goes to work, comes back, and all these things are done for him. So he he just naturally has more time than I do. So I think that women get on board when things become more certain rather than in the beginning days when it, it, it's a little bit more experimental um then by that time the boys clubs have already developed and so it's a little bit tricky to become a part of 
large male groups for a couple of reasons really some men might feel more comfortable with men men do favors for each other a lot more than they would do favors for women most of the opportunities that i've had in this space have come from women and i'm guessing that that's what it so if there's more men more men have more opportunities and i and one guy and i'm not saying that this is correct actually said he felt women were actively excluded from speaking at events and the like um i know that i've got some friends that feel that say if you're sitting uh, on a on a stool or something at an event a man will walk up to a man and ignore the woman even though they're probably of equal that it's it's a it's social conditioning as well i think it's like a programming maybe um i think i think there's lots lots of reasons as to why uh, i i don't know if it's a quick i don't think there's any kind of quick fix really and i don't think it's anyone's fault either i think it's just the the way that it happens it's it, it's society we 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 don't live in an equal world um and we have different roles just go I mean, think about it like 100 years ago women didn't even have the vote and we've had to kind of build up from that and so getting to a point where you're respected um listened to accept you know it, it's not it's not it's not going to be easy because my mum for example her brother got sent to university and she didn't her role was going to be a cashier in a bank he went on to be an optician so even just one generation back they were disadvantaged and not treated the same so it's going to take a little while before that gets washed out i think uh, the the goal is anyways that the whole world has bitcoin and that then it's equal <laughs> and then it, it will definitely be equal but what do you think what do you think about the things that i've said do you think that they sound logical or is there anything that i said that you think doesn't sound right I don't know uh, about the time aspect. Uh, that's the only thing that was not logical to me 100%. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting argument because uh, it's, I, I don't know about the time aspect, uh, but I don't, also don't know if it's not true. I don't have a good argument against it. The only thing that I 100% know is my own experience when I go in my friend circle and tell uh, male friends of mine, hey, there's this Bitcoin thing, you want to check it out. Um, male are way more um, uh, easier to jump on, like, oh, yeah, okay, let's do it. Uh, there's 100 euros, where can I buy it? Like, they, they are like, if, if they are good friends of mine, they're like, oh, let's let's try, let's, let's find out. With female friends, I have way more hurdles to go over. Like, it, it takes a little bit more convincing of them. That's maybe just because I'm male. Uh, that's maybe that's just a natural thing of, of mine. But I've seen that male are more just jumping into a risk, uh, apparent risk for them, even though Bitcoin is not risky. And maybe uh, female are more the collector type that they, they want to uh, not risk. Uh, they're not, maybe not that risk taking. I don't know. Like that's, that's just like a, a very subjective <laughs> feeling that I got from orange pilling friends. Uh, but one of my uh, friends that is most impressive to me uh, what, with the orange peeling process is a female. She is amazing. She's even coming to me with me to to Bitcoin Amsterdam. Are you there? Yeah, I, I, will, I will be there. Uh, it's, it's actually my first speaker engagement. I will be the first time speaking at, Bit, uh, at a Bitcoin uh, conference, uh, I think, with with Bram and, and, and two other people. Uh, I don't know the... the uh, the, the stage girl, I think Captain Sid is the other one. I forgot the other name. Oh, mm. sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I'm, I will be on stage. I will be moderating. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but yeah, she's coming uh, uh, with me. And I think she is the friend that actually got it the best uh, till now. And, and that's interesting. Yeah. But more, I have, I have more uh, male friends that have it and, and they're all in. And it's, it's like even to have, it's, it's so funny because she has, uh, not all her money in Bitcoin, but she understands it very well. But I have male friends that have had all your money, all their money in Bitcoin, but they don't understand it that well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, maybe that's just a, a subjective thing from mine that like uh, male are taking more risk uh, or like are quicker to jump into something. 
Um, but that's just an observation from mine. Yeah, and it, but it's also difficult having the conversation because whatever I say will probably offend somebody because they'll think someone will be listening to it thinking that it's a direct dig and it isn't in any way at all. So it's a really hard thing to have a conversation about openly because I feel like someone's going to get offended by something that I say. Yeah, it's, it's interesting um, when we talk about something uh, that is controversial. I think that should not be controversial. No. Uh, because one thing that it's for certain, there are differences between male and female, and we should not uh, pretend that they are the complete equal, like from, from just like uh, from their properties. Uh, they are doing different things and they are do. it's not like one thing is better than the other thing. They're just like different. Uh, the same way that an uh, eighty-year-old uh, guy is different from a ten-year-old guy, uh, if, if you understand what I mean. Well, yeah, I, I do, but I, I don't actually like that argument because I think that everybody has a different brain and they all have different skill sets and different abilities. And when you pigeonhole somebody because they're male or female you're assuming that they have a certain type of brain or a certain type of thinking or certain attributes. But really, we should be looking at people as individual and taking them on face value rather than assuming what they're like based on their gender. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, there, there are definitely if you take the average, here, but that's like putting someone in a in in a in a in a drawer, uh, it's mm -hmm. like female. I understand what you're, what you're taking, but the, the average, uh, you can make the differences uh, average uh, when you look at an average, but definitely on an individual size, like everyone is so different. And uh, there's, there, there are uh, so many different examples of that, so like on, on an individual level. So I think that's a, it's a, it's a good point, but yeah, maybe, uh, maybe it should be an, uh, a topic that should not even be a topic and we should just take it as face value uh, and it will turn out naturally because then uh, it, it's not that big of a topic. Maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe that discussion is not even uh, the, the fact that we have the discussion uh, kind of uh, makes the topic harder. Like, is, mm. <laughs> do, do you follow my <laughs> logic? So, yeah. Yeah, no, it, well, it's tricky and it will work itself out. I mean, it has to. If we want global adoption, it has to be 50 50. So, yeah, hopefully, yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how long do you think um, we will we will be, be at uh, that that point where we have a, a major Bitcoin adoption if we are successful? I don't know what I don't know what global adoption looks like. I don't know how many users would have to be on board for it to be considered global adoption. Um, but I think in the next cycle, I think uh, I think it's going to happen a lot quicker. Than, than we think, because I think a lot of countries are starting to pay attention, but I think they're keeping it quiet. And I don't think they're advertising what their plans are. So I, I think that, I think it could happen really quickly when it does. Yeah, I hope so too. Uh, and they're, they're probably, if I would be a country and I have the chance and I, I get Bitcoin uh, and I slowly start buying it, and I don't have to disclose it. I will not disclose it. Yeah. <laughs> that would be stupid of me. Mm. Yeah. So, so that uh, that could be a, a I wouldn't good tell point. anyone if I was mining it either. I, I would I would try and keep that quiet too. I mean, we know of some countries with like El Salvador and and uh, how is it called? Pudan, P Puda, yeah. something like that. Are they buying? They were buying it on the sly. They've got something like zero point one for every citizen, haven't they? That's what they managed to get. I think the, I heard something with like 700 million in total, but I could be wrong. I think so, something I, I read, but yeah, they, they have they have Bitcoin and, and that's amazing. Mm. The small countries that have Bitcoin. But I think everyone is waiting for like the first big country like Argentina. Uh, that would be a, a, a great one. Or maybe even like Germany, even though they sold... <laughs> A bit cold yeah. than they confiscated. Yeah, it's an it's an interesting discussion. Um, well, it's interesting because they uh, Mille just wants the freedom to transact, which seems like the most sensible way to go. That if you want to transact in apples because that is useful to you, then go for it. You know, if you want to transact in Bitcoin, then that's fine too. I think his 
point is that people should choose the type of currency that is useful to them in that moment without being told you have to use the US dollar or you have to use this. So I think I think the freedom to transact is the most sensible way to go. That would be, I, I would love that. I mean, it's a different route that El Salvador took because they are actively trying to get rid of uh, um, altcoins, shitcoins. Um, and they're really trying to, to, to push Bitcoin. Uh, I think they are really like trying to, to get ahead. They are taking a startup approach. But I think for a bigger country uh, like Argentina, it would be way more clever to do it like uh, Millet said, like, oh yeah, we, we lift all the capital gains on, on, on Bitcoin and, and those things. And if you want to transact and pay with Bitcoin for your local beer or whatever, uh, you should not be having... Uh, capital gains tax on that like you should be just able to feel freely transact with that and i think that's a, a really cool approach and um i'm waiting for when america does that because then it's like the we're off to the races for the international mm -hmm. game theory with the uk with the eurozone uh, i i would i would love to i would love to see that mm. really yeah. really cool and before we come to the end routine of the podcast um I would like to ask a question. Um, is there anything that I forgot to ask you? Is there anything, uh, uh, important topic for you that, that you would like to discuss in the podcast or bring in the podcast uh, that I forgot to, to bring up? I don't think so. No, I can't think of anything. No, everything that I'm focused on at the moment is just, is to do with the BBC. <laughs> I'm just obsessed with it at the moment. I'm so I'm so annoyed that they can get away with it that I almost I, I, I think about it in my sleep. I'm just completely consumed by how how I can get this retraction. So yeah, at the moment though. Oh. <laughs> I mean it's it, it's it's really it's really weird that they can still have it up there. I think it's ten months you said it is, right? Mm. 10 months so it started so when i first started trying to i put like i said i put in a freedom of information request that got denied then i went to the information commissioner's office to see if i could get that denial overturned they upheld the bbc's um denial so then i was like okay i wrote to the a journalist who wrote the article i wrote to the bbc crypto correspondent i wrote to the press office and i got ignored the only person that confirmed receipt of the email was a crypto correspondent. That's the only person that's been helpful in this whole thing. So then I reached another dead end and then I reached back out to all of them again. And then it was only in June that the press office said, why don't you go to editorial complaints? Well, this whole time that I'd been hammering at the door, no one had told me about editorial complaints. I couldn't find anything about it. Um, so I submitted, I submitted that in June. And then kept getting emails to say, we're really sorry that this has taken this long. We are working on it. And then the second email that I got said, we're aware that this has taken longer than we thought. You should go to Ofcom. I was like, oh, God, another job. Yeah, thanks. OK, so I'll go to Ofcom, fill out the form. And then they send me back something that says, thank you. We've got your information. We won't get back to you, but but please know that we've got it. And I'm like, great. So they literally sent me down another dead end which I just thought was terrible. And then they, when they did send the response back finally, they hadn't taken any of my evidence into consideration. They went back to the original discredited source to prove their discredited information. It was really quite weird. So, um, yeah, so now it's just because I'm going around in all these circles trying to keep tabs of and, and every time you have to submit something, it's a chunk of work that I'm not getting paid for. And the, the, the fun, no, actually, I was going to say, maybe cut this bit out, right? but I would have got paid for the article that I wrote for Forbes, but it got unpublished. So the only thing that I could have got paid for. So literally everything that I've done is all unpaid and there's no one there's no one who's going to pay journalists properly to do proper investigative work so that's why we have poor journalism because if you want to do something properly you have to do it off your own back uh, that's that's sad to a certain extent it's it's, it's it really is, is is weird uh what is what was the saying off con what was the last one i Ofcom. So say if there's a complaint about something that you've seen on TV or heard on the radio or something like that, you go to Ofcom. 
But when oh. they suggested that, they would have known that it was another dead end. It's like, do you know from uh, Asterix and Obelix, the one episode uh, where they have to make a task and they have to find a form inside a government building and they'd like get... Uh, the, the whole week or something like that uh, pushed around like oh you have to go to this room this room this room this room and they are like always this those dead ends uh, I don't know if I'm a big fan of that series but um, maybe maybe it's not that popular outside of Austria <laughs> I don't know uh, and it but it's it, it reminds me of that and sometimes when I interact with something that is close to the governments or is almost government it, it it reminds me of that a lot like you have to ah you have to fill out that form but you need that for that form and you have to go there mm. oh you don't have that you f first have to go there they're always very um kind and very like oh yeah you have to fi find this find this and very uh not personal and they're not tr really trying to help you they're just tr trying to get you away from you and then go to the next person. Maybe he can help you, but I know he cannot help you. So that's that's kind of the feeling I got from what, what you were describing with your dead ends. Mm, yep. Yep. Yeah. It's just being tied up in bureaucracy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. Then uh, let's come to the end routine. Uh, there's two questions. The first question is always the same question for each guest. Um, first question, uh, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and all the things that we already talked about? Bitcoin and besides Bitcoin, am I allowed to say Bitcoin mining? Yeah, why not? Okay. So I, I, Bitcoin mining is a, is a big subject that I'm really interested in and the um, carbon Uh, emissions reduction and the methane reduction and how you can mine off landfill and all the amazing things that Bitcoin mining can do. So that, so as I said, I'm um, the head of mining and energy for Bitcoin Policy UK and we're looking at projects at the moment where we are looking to grow vegetables for disused sites, trying to breathe life back into businesses using Bitcoin mining that would otherwise be mothballed. That's interesting. I like that a lot. Really cool. Um, yeah, perfect. Then let's get to the other end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, the question for you is, what scares you the most, a world without Bitcoin or a world where Bitcoin gets captured as and functions as a world dystopian surveillance tool? Authoritarianism <laughs> yeah, and the world that my children are going to inherit. Seems to be, seems to be the obvious answer. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Uh, I, ho I hope we can get to a world where there is Bitcoin and there is no dystopian uh, surveillance tool. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Susie, for being on. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions, find your stuff, find the BBC article? Uh, well, the BBC article got taken down, unpublished, so you can't find it. Well, you you could wait, oh. wait the, the bbc <laughs> article with the swimming um oh that thing. one oh, okay yeah <laughs> we can do, sorry <laughs> so, sorry just, just google um uh bitcoin transaction swimming pool and it will come up and where can people uh, find your stuff uh and, and ask you questions if they have some so you can find my articles on forbes i've also written opinion pieces for city am i loved that i could rant about how broken the world was and then just write about how bitcoin could fix it so that they're cool if you ever want to look at my work on city am um you can find me on twitter decentrasus or uh read my Substack. perfect thank you so much uh for for being on today also thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening as always i'll be back tomorrow with another episode bye bye